the fallout from the shooting in Las Vegas, plus debate out of Lansing on auto insurance and term limit reforms. Also, one Detroit special report on life after deportation. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson are here, and my week starts right now. The Business Leaders for Michigan CEO Summit is Thursday, November 9th at the Westin Book Cadillac in Detroit. Hear top-notch speakers such as Andrew Liveris, Brian Walker, and Jim Hackett. They will share ideas to grow economically in an ever-changing marketplace. Experience five hours of networking opportunities with 500 top business, community, and policymaking leaders. Learn more at www.businessleadersformichigan.com. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. Our contributors Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press are here with us. And we have to start with what happened in Las Vegas this week, the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. You know, on this show, we try to put news events in perspective, give you both sides of policies that could shape what is happening next. We've debated gun limitations, federal loopholes after Sandy Hook, after San Bernardino, after Orlando. And in these past few days, there has been debate over how we even talk about this shooting. Is it too soon to talk about limiting ammunition and gun purchases? Are we even foolish to talk about gun control when it hasn't even happened yet after those other shootings? Both Nolan and Stephen took very different angles when writing about the shooting this week. So let's start there. Hi, guys. It's good to see you this hey. week. And, and, and on a week of, I think, it's been very difficult, I think, for everyone across the country to, to process what has happened. Um, before I get to what both of you wrote, this week about about mm -hmm. the shooting. I want to first ask you, what was it about this event that happened? Did anything different stand out to you besides the, the obvious in terms of the number of casualties that we had and the number of people struck? Is there anything about the shooting that has struck you different than what we have talked about before? Nolan, I'm going to start with you. I think this is the longest we've gone without having a even a hint of what motivated this seemingly normal 64-year-old rich white retiree from Las Vegas. He fits no profile uh, and nothing has emerged yet uh, as of this taping that would suggest what drove him. Uh, the FBI interviewed his girlfriend yesterday. She offered no clues. There's no notes. There's no Facebook pages or anything that would suggest an affiliation. I know ISIS took credit for it right away. I think that was probably opportunistic. Uh, but why the why of it. I mean, there's never obviously a good reason, but there's generally by now we know so reason. And people want to, yeah, to kind of just see what would have pushed someone to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, what, what changed or what was different to you? Well, I mean, again, the, the randomness of this, right? You're at a concert uh, with, with thousands and thousands of people. It is literally the last place I think you would think you would have to even be looking out for this kind of uh, thing and and this is going to sound a little morbid, but I'm actually surprised that we don't see more of this kind of thing. It's so easy to do, as he proved on Sunday, that you can get the guns, uh, you can get access to a spot up high, and you can do a lot of damage in a little bit of time. I, I think that's, that's what it was. You decide to do it. I think that's what it was in terms of the the height and the distance, mm -hmm. the how far away he was mm -hmm. from the scene, um, and and the fact that there was no apparently suspicious activity that anyone saw him coming and going with the amount of weapons. How could that have been? That well, he had see, in that yeah, room. I think and, that's and part the of the, that's part of the, the 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 problem with the narrative here is. If, I guarantee you, if I walked into a hotel in Las Vegas with 10 bags of guns, lots of people would notice that. And there would be all kinds of response to it. And there should be. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But the fact that this guy was able to do that without anybody's notice speaks to, uh, again, a kind of bias that we have in this society about and, who's who's likely to do and something. And I think that's bringing the huge interest. He was so nondescript. I mean, he's an old guy. I mean... Even well, 64 if were, is not that old. Well, I mean, when you. you say old Thank guy. You. But he's not, he fits no, no, no 
sort of mold or profile. I, I think yeah, but the profile, a, even if a, a, a 64 year old successful um, African American come in with a bunch of suitcases, no nobody way. be ringing bells. There was nothing about. Yeah, I disagree this. with that. But well, you know, I, I want to ask you both now about why you took the certain tax that you did in writing about it this week, Nolan. The the headline on your column was stereotyping Vegas victims is offensive. What well, that, is it that you that drove you that that was what you were going to write well, about this shooting? No, that was the that was Wednesday. Um, yesterday, Wednesday, yeah. And today, I wrote about sort of the futility of the gun control debate, um, which is probably a little more relevant uh, to the discussion. But the the, the thing that, that just drove me nuts were you know the immediate politicization of this, and you had a, a few commentators out there. We had one TV executive fired for it, but you had a few commentators who were trying to extrapolate and say, okay, they're country music fans, they must be Republicans, they support then politicians who don't support gun control, and you know that whole string that they were unraveling there made it sound like, well, okay, just desserts, and which is basically what the TV executive, was it CBS or ABC, who was fired for, for saying, I can't get any sympathy for people because they must have been Republicans. Well, first of all, you can't assume all country music fans mm -hmm. are Republicans. That's sort of stereotyping of victims immediately after the shooting. I thought speaks really to the unsavory place we are in, in terms of our political debate in, in America today. They were all Americans, just like the ones in the nightclub in, in Orlando. All Americans, all dead, and none of them deserve to die. I do want to get to the, is it, is it futile to have the, the gun control debate in mm -hmm. just a moment? But Stephen, yours was the Las Vegas shooting, politics, race, and, and terrorism. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an interesting conversation going on about how to describe something like this, right? Uh, this is a, this has all the markings of a terrorist act in the sense of uh, the mass nature of it and uh, the, the, the sheer violence of it. But, but then this is a guy who claims no real affiliation, uh, affiliation that we know of at right. this point. Uh, but I also think there is a political context to what he did that, that gives it some political motive. Uh, the, the people who insist on this, this uh, society of unbridled manufacture and distribution of weapons of mass destruction, which is what these are, these things that he was using, uh, they are, they have bought our, our government, they have uh, skewed the conversation so badly. I mean, 63% of Americans want tighter gun control, and yet we haven't seen significant gun legislation by Congress in, what, 30 years? Uh, there is a political motive behind this, and it is the defense of any reasonable uh, a restraint on the manufacture or distribution of these weapons. Should we bother to even have this debate about gun control when we haven't been able to push anything through after horrific events, well, after 20 children well, are shot and killed inside of a school? Um, are we at the point where nothing can be done and the argument will keep going back saying, well, anything that you do, any policy you put in place wouldn't have stopped this guy? I think you're seeing, you, you, you're seeing this time, you, you've got now Republicans and Democrats at least coming together and saying we can support uh, legislation on this, these bump stocks that allowed him to convert, convert a semi-automatic yes. to auto, that sensible legislation. I would support that. Um, but I think first, you, you've got both sides have to move off off their hard positions and move and, and approach this in some reasonable way. I mean, we tried a ban on assault weapons between 1994 and 2004, and not much. Uh, it helped. It but didn't. It wasn't, it yeah, wasn't I looked at the stats yesterday. There's no measurable impact on 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 gun violence or mass shootings. I mean, and then I think we also have to recognize, over the last 25 years, gun violence, gun or killings by gun, have sh have have gone down 36 percent. So we have made progress in the area of gun violence. Uh, so we should look at what's working and try to try to double down on that. Um, you know, we always focus on assault weapons as, you know, as if that's some kind of magic, magic uh, formula here. Rifles, which, which are the c category that assault these AK and AR weapons fall into, less than 3% of the gun deaths. You're six times more likely to be stabbed to death, three times more likely to be beaten to death. G the, the primary, 
the primary problem is handguns, and we never really get around to after one of these incidents because so few occur with, with handguns. So we, you're talking about never, handguns also in, in, in terms of suicide rates as well, well and what they're, they're yeah, being used yeah, as there. Yeah. But let me... But also look at... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, look, at, look at the... I mean, Nolan's right that, that gun violence is going down generally. It's not going down in urban areas, right? So in Detroit, in Chicago, in Baltimore this year, uh, we have uh, murder rates and murder numbers that look like they did 20 years ago before significant reforms in criminal justice uh, were made, and they are all committed with guns, some with handguns, mm -hmm. some with uh, the semi-automatic uh, rifle. So, so it is not uh, an all-good story in terms of where, where we're headed. At the same time, we never, I, I think the thing we never talk about is why are you allowed to manufacture and distribute these weapons. Now, you can't do it with automatic weapons. I mean, those are not legal mm -hmm. to buy, uh, but somehow people get them, which, uh, again, I think should be uh, uh, traceable and liable, uh, attached, liability should be attached to the manufacturers and the distributors for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most handguns that criminals end up with were at one time bought legally. People, legal gun buyers, uh, have their guns stolen or whatever they do with them, and they end up in illegal hands. I think we got to start talking about how that happens. How do we get to the place where people who shouldn't have guns have them and start tracing back liability to the people who are doing it? Well, I, you know, that's an area we, we have some agreement on in this issue. Yeah. I'm a strong mm -hmm. Second Amendment right. person, right. but I believe, like any other right, you believe in reason, legal gun ownership. Reason, right. legal, yeah. And responsible. And, responsible. and uh, one of the things that, well, um, an untold story here is um, in, in, in the city of Detroit, when legal gun owners arrive at many venues, including the football stadiums and baseball stadiums, and say, oh my God, my gun's in my pocket, I can't get through the checkpoint, they go back to the car and lock it in the car, and, and there are people watching, there are a great number of break-ins in cars around that, that, around those stadiums from people looking for guns. You, you, people know they're heading for a, to a ball game, they know they can't bring their gun in. You'd never leave a gun in a lock in car. A car. You never leave a, gu a, a, a gun like we had in that um, nursery shooting um, while I was gone. You never leave a gun out where children can get it. I own a lot of weapons, every single one of them. How many weapons is, is, do you own, do you mind if I ask you? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> All right. Every single one of them is in a gun safe. Okay, where, well that leads me actually no to my, children that leads me to, to actually my next point though, because something that struck me about this story was the number of weapons that this man had. Mm -hmm. and the fact that he purchased 33 of them in the last year alone. And according to the ATF, there's no kind of federal regulation on how many, of course not. Not, not, not on how many weapons that you can have, but the frequency, I mean, that there is no flagging system that if you purchase 25 rifles or 25 any kind of gun in a month's time, there's no kind of flagging to the government saying, hey, does, you know, some guys in our system that just purchased 25 yeah, rifles. And that would be, you know, that would be perhaps a, a, a red flag you can look at. I mean, you've got to walk carefully with that to, to meet constitutional standards. But everybody is focused on the fact he had 25, 30 weapons, whatever it was, between that room and his house or more in his house. How many did he use? I mean, you can you well, can used kill. A couple of them. Wait, oh, I know. He went through magazines well, and yeah, didn't reload. He just picked up another gun. He used a lot of magazines, but he didn't use all 25 of those guns. You have, if he had three guns in that room, he could have killed as many people. And we focus on the number. And that's part and, of the problem, though. Why can I buy a gun? But he was no more deadly because he had 25 guns than because well, he, he had but he three. Could, but he could have used them if, if it could took have, them. But if he it, didn't. But it took them longer to find them. But Look, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make a correlation that may be a little bit lame. But I thought about it this week. You know, when I go to the drugstore and I've got a cold and I want to buy Sudafed, they need to run my license mm -hmm. and they will stop me from buying a, a, a lot of Sudafed <laughs> because of I had a really bad cold once. And I remember them stopping me, and within a week's time, that I couldn't get more than a certain right. amount. How come we can't transfer something the like answer, that? The answer is the lobby. There is no other answer for that. It is that you have uh, a very powerful lobby that represents the interests of 
gun manufacturers and distributors. It does not actually represent, in my opinion, the interest of gun well, owners. It, it preys on the fears of gun owners who, mm -hmm. who think that any, any, you know, any sort of encroachment on this constitutional right is, is a hair step away but, from gun confisca confiscation, yeah. which it's not, uh, but they, they are acting on behalf of the industry that profits. The profits from this also, by the way, are tied to the violence. All of the gun stocks this week went up, and not just a little bit. They went up a lot. Why? Because gun they manufacturers like, folks like you are going to come <laughs> grab the guns. Well, exactly. I mean, this is <laughs> a cyclical. Time. This is a cyclical uh, uh, activity that protects gun manufacturers and distributors from logical restraint. But, so let me, so again, let me ask you this. So hang on. Let me let me ask you this. So we're at this point that things happen. Something big happens. We talk a lot about it. Is there going to be any action on it? And okay. I find it very interesting that you've got Gabby Giffords, who was the victim mm -hmm. of a, of a yeah. shooting, and you have Steve Scalise, who was the victim of a shooting as well. And they are in Congress now, mm -hmm. um, and they still come from they come from two different sides of this okay. equation. Because everybody says, and this is what I wrote today: let's do something. Nobody can can put anything on the table today. Is there anything to that do? would have stopped? this shooting so we're reacting to a specific incident but does that, that mean that you stop what do you do? everything so, what do you do? so what if as long what as if, there's 300 million guns in circulation those guns are going to be what if some of those what guns if some of the liability abused. for this was be, to be traced back to the people who either sold him the guns the people who manufactured those guns or the people who stole those guns or whatever however he got them he got the guns he legally, got these guns legally and you can and you can no more you can no more uh, assign liability to the people who manufactured and sold those guns than you can an automaker who but there's a reason for that ends up i agree that's under the way control of a that's, drunk driver. that's the way the law looks right now that is not what the constitution says it says nothing even you, close to that you open and we that won't door get and to, there's no product uh, your kitchen That's knives. not true. That's There's not no true. product that'll be safe. That's from, not true. So a kitchen knife, sort of a kitchen knife has a productive, safe use. So does a gun. Uh, an automatic weapon does not. And you a can't buy an automatic weapon. A semi-automatic. But why? But can you, you can make buy it? something that makes it an automatic. Right. Weapon. And why you can you buy something that makes it? You can make a an automatic weapon. If they want to ban bump stocks, I think you're going to find consensus Who's, on so that. So how do automatic weapons get into the country? Automatic weapons are are, you, are not available for sale to a normal people. So how do people today? have them? They well, do what this guy did. They convert. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not saying we shouldn't. My point is that the, bumps, the, the liability for this is all is all detached from the people who are responsible. Now, people if who are you're responsible making are the and ones distributing who the this stuff, then mm. then you should you should be held responsible when somebody uses it. And, uh, and we never want to push this conversation beyond. In, in I'm more, fine to push it. Hang on, let's do that. Like, of what? Why in the world are we such a violent society? And it's why? Been a violent nation since the beginning. Well, why, I think that I, you know what, and are, I I agree with that. We, Nolan. Why do why are we letting our kids say but all they have day never long been able but they've never been able to decide in Washington to give the money to the research to back see what was happening with the gun violence that has always been it's a like, non-starter as well you need research to know that's not a good idea to sit your kids in front of a uh, a man of war uh, Video shooting game people all day. Or, or, yeah, but or, this or, guy or is 64 TV, years old. He wasn't sitting nothing, in front of a video game when he was a kid. No, but we do have, I mean, if you're going to do just deal just with this incident, deal with it because there's nothing you could have done yeah. that would have stopped this. If, if you couldn't get those guns. See, this is, the, this is the thing that's the fallacy that we fall back on all the time. Other societies don't see this kind of thing happen. And the Other reason, societies don't have a Second the, Amendment. But the Second Amendment doesn't prevent us from saying, the Second Amendment doesn't allow this kind of thing. And it, it never imagined what, this kind what of would, thing. What would the Second well, Amendment the words, should, the words, should have permitted here? The words well-regulated and militia ah, actually well, have meaning. The Supreme Court's already decided Yeah, that well, state. a Supreme Court that's so under the influence of whom? You, the law, I would uh, hope, well, the Constitution. Uh, how about the NRA? I mean, I mean the, come on. There's no this other right. A, You're interpreting that as some kind of group right, no other right in the Bill of Rights is not assigned to a group. It, except that's that, except that, in, that except was intended that the words, for an individual right. No, it wasn't. So the government couldn't come it and was, confiscate individual It was actually weapons. intended. It was actually intended to protect us against British troops who were sitting right across the Detroit River. And in, in case they decided to invade again, you needed to be able to, to have people but defend assigned, the country. It assigned the right to individuals. It didn't say Listen, communities can have a big mean, stock of weapons that will check in and out. You know what? Like I'm, not a, I'm not somebody who thinks that the right doesn't exist. I'm mm -hmm. somebody who thinks that the words well-regulated 
and uh, in particular, and militia have meaning. And they, they have, uh, the, the current interpretation is that they have no meaning, and that is absurd. Yeah. There is no amendment in the Constitution that is interpreted that way other than that. And I think we're getting a good idea of why the, the gun debate and mm -hmm. uh, the nuance of and again, it. And again, I think, hard to, it's hard to, I think it's there's hard. room for reasonable regulation. I think it's pointless to pass feel-good legislation that, no, that doesn't that. work. Yeah, as long as you have 300 million guns circulating in this country, That's a nothing's problem. going to... So what do you do about that? Well, what well, could you do other than wow. start confiscating mm -hmm. weapons? I, but confiscating but, illegal weapons, what's the, what's the problem with that? There's no problem confiscating illegal, but not all of those 300. In fact, most of those 300 million are not illegal. And that's the problem. You have legal owners whose guns end up being used in a legal you manner. You have legal owners like this fellow who uses his gun illegal. Yeah, How would no. you have stopped this with any I wouldn't, piece of regulation? I mean, Nolan, I wouldn't permit the, the, the manufacture and sale of some of these weapons. I mean, we do that with all kinds of products. Right? Of this the, product of is the not assault, of the this assault product. bam. We tried that; it didn't work. Did, and that was about sales. You're arguing about that a, was about sales. You're focusing on a cosmetic difference between this gun and the it's and the not thirty out six well, I have in my in my um, gun safe, which does the same exact thing. Say that to the people whose family who are bearing family it's members the same, in Vegas. It's the same. It's the same weapon. Not, it, it's the same weapon. It right. just looks different. The idea right, that no more the idea that nothing could prevent this is. On its face, just just patently well, I, I think, I think I, well, I think you, we need to get. You tell I think me if he didn't use an AK weapon, he couldn't have taken a 30 out six deer rifle in, and done the same in the thing. In the larger I'm conversation, maybe not as effective. Table. I'm telling you, if somebody owned one. I'm saying could. in the in the larger conversation. In the, in the, in the, in the, okay, gentlemen, in the larger conversation, in the larger conversation, we need to get beyond. It, it, we wouldn't have affected what happened yesterday, and and maybe look a little yeah. bit look a little we, bit big picture. We All right, to do with we're going to we're going to wrap everyone. it up. I agree with you on that. We're just going to hit a couple of other things real mm -hmm. quick before we have to go. Turning now to Lansing, a few debates brewing there. Testimony this week about auto insurance reform and the push to change term limits taking on new force. Uh, the Michigan uh, Chamber coming out this week, Nolan, talking about, all right, we don't want to like um, bury term limits, but we want to change them around a little bit. We want to yeah. extend it uh, a, a little bit. A an interesting idea. What do you think? I think it's a good idea. They're doing it in, in you know, they're furious with Brian Kelly for that part-time proposal. He yeah, how does, that, how does that all end up matching you know, up then? It, they don't. I mean, they, this is a direct response it's to that, trying right. to head that off. Um, a part-time legislature with no extension of term limits would be a disaster, or no um, end of term limits yeah. would be a disaster. Chambers coming back saying, if we, taking a remedy other states have used, if we allow lawmakers, instead of you can use, spend six here and eight there, um, you can spend 12 all in one chamber. You want. And hopefully by the time you're in your seventh and eighth year, you've got the extra expertise and experience you need to be an effective lawmaker. Why do we need to extend the term limits? Well, I wouldn't extend them. I would get rid of them. Me I too. Just, yeah. I just don't, I don't particularly care feasible. for that. Yeah, I, I don't particularly care for that, that feature of uh, Why isn't it politically government? feasible well, when you've got 30 well, other states really, that it's do not really have popular term limits? Here. It's still really popular here. And I think people don't make the connection between the really awful policy that we see uh, at the state level and the things we can't get done and term limits. They think it's other things. They think it's uh, uh, lobbyists or they think it's, uh, you know, uh, bitter partisanship. And those things are a problem too. But the term limits, I think, are the accelerant that make uh, yeah. all of those things really, really awful to deal with. I, I think if you're going to extend it, I would extend it, I mean, or, or change it. I would extend the time too. I would say 16, 16 years, years makes more I mean, sense yeah. to me. But, but they're afraid, I mean, they're they're just afraid they can't if get you could get that voters, that's a, it's a, it's yeah, we're better gonna, than so trying to have a big turnover but you look oh, 70 percent of the same everybody's going right house. but tom Leonard, leonard two years as house speaker he's out now at the yeah. end of um next, next year. year and oh uh, by the way i'm going to run for attorney general right. it hasn't created a class of citizen politi politicians who serve well and that's go right home. they don't leave either. they pogo stick they're kind of looking for the they kind of end up looking for the next job that's all they focus on in lansing well they get the bug right i mean once you get elected it's harder and harder uh, the longer you're there i think i've seen this over and over again uh, the longer you stay, the more you, you, you come to think of it as important work and, and that you have a place in it. Uh, and, and that's okay. I think that's actually, 
uh, valuable because that's how we get veteran legislators who actually know what they're doing and mm -hmm. have and seen lots of things. And are prepared to move in other jobs. John that's Ingram right. was 20 years in the legislature right. before he became governor. Whether you liked his policies or not, you can't argue with doing. the fact that he knew how government worked right. and how to get things done. That's right. Another thing happening in Lansing this week, um, testimony about uh, auto insurance reform. Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be as an easy as a path as uh, we once thought? Looks like it's breaking apart. I mean, yeah. um, trial attorneys and the hospital hospitals and, and medical providers, uh, health insurance company. It's kind of a, a powerful coalition against Well, the House state. Fiscal Agency came out and said uh, $150 million on the state's Medicaid system in yeah. 10 years. That's yeah. That's a, well, a, I mean, yeah. somebody's got to pay, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're going to uh, make sure people are not out there by themselves when they get in these catastrophic accidents, if yeah. the car insurance company is not going to pay, then somebody else The health insurance yeah. or, or the government's going right. to have to pay. And so... It, it looks like we're not going to see much, any rate relief for for Detroit drivers. Yeah, because they they still can uh, charge rates based on zip code and yeah, I think that's what that we stuff, should be doing. That's a big with, right. That's we, redlining that's is one of the things. Yeah. That you know, we can that. deal with that, yeah. but unless we do something about these medical costs, then it it's not going to come down. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks. And it's, uh, I think that's uh, actually we we have uh, one more. Uh, one, One more, more segment thing. here, yeah. Oh. Do we, or are we just for saying goodnight? Sorry, we ran out of time. That's going to do it for my week. We'll see you back, we'll come back Thursday. Next week. Take care. We'll I'll, have, my, I'll next. have it together there. Thanks. <laughs>